and welcome to this talk about Android Automotive. Um, so I'm going to tell you about um, what's going on in the uh, automotive industry and why Android is uh, becoming very popular with these guys. Um, skip that bit. A little bit about myself. Um, so I'm a uh, trainer and, um, and freelance engineer. I've been doing this stuff for quite some time. I've been doing stuff with embedded Linux for 20 or something years. And I wrote a book about the subject, just saying it's quite a good book. Um, and I'd like to make a disclaimer about my relationship with Google, which is that I don't have one. So this is in no way sp sponsored by Google. I've never signed an NDA uh, with Google. So this is entirely my own work. So having said all that then, what I want to do then is to talk a little bit about um, Android and how it's been deployed uh, in the automotive industry um, as a means of uh, uh, controlling the, um, the IVI system. So here's the first example of a, a vehicle you can actually go out and buy, uh, which has um, uh, Android Automotive embedded. Uh, this is the good old Polestar 2, and there's the very prominent Android display there in the middle, uh, which does look a little bit like it's been glued, like, like, like a tablet that's been glued onto the dashboard, but that's the way it looks. So Android, uh, sorry, Google have been interested in Android in the car for quite some time. So they started off 2014 uh, talking about a thing called Android Auto. Now, a lot of you probably use Android Auto. So this is where you have your smartphone connected either via Bluetooth or, uh, sorry, connected either via uh, USB or, or maybe Wi-Fi uh, to the head unit. But in that case, the intelligence, the application is running on the phone and the head unit is really just providing a screen. Um, 2017, they came up with um, Automotive OS, which is what I'm talking about. So this is Android running actually in the head unit. Oh yeah, little thing at the bottom there. Uh, it turns out this is not the first time anybody has used Android for a head unit, um, particularly the uh, those manufacturers I mentioned there have been running Android in the head unit for quite a long time. You can kind of see, though, that because they did their own port of Android, um, they've kind of got stuck on old versions, in some cases very old versions uh, of Android. But now this is part of Google's plan for Android. So this is the, <laughs> this is the way that a lot of people are doing it now. So the first thing to say then is that Android Automotive OS is open source. It is part of the AOSP, the Open Android Open Source Project. So anybody can download this stuff and build a system from it. However, um, what you get from the open source uh, implementation is not really production ready. Um, you need to do some customization uh, of the home screen, at the very least, the home screen as the default home screen is not really very usable. Uh, you need some applications which actually interface with the vehicle and do things like turning lights on and off and making windows go up and down and that kind of stuff. Um, and you need the back end services for navigation, uh, speech recognition, uh, that kind of thing. So Google have a solution for this, of course. It's called Google Automotive Services, GAS. So this is a, um, a licensed uh, package of software you get from Google. Uh, so it includes Play Store, includes navigation, uh, Google Assistant, so you can do um, uh, hands-free driving, hands-free commands and such like. Um, it's not free. So there's a per unit license, and in order to get that license, you have to pass a whole bunch of tests, including the compatibility test suite, the 
uh, vendor test suite and the automotive test suite and possibly some others which I um, don't know about. And you must deploy Google's apps. You can't, for example, replace the navigation with your own navigation. You've got to use Google Maps. Now, not everybody is happy with this. So some uh, auto manufacturers are um, taking the open source uh, Android and they are implementing their own services. And there are companies that do basically SDKs you can purchase uh, to, to do all this stuff. So you're going to see a combination of uh, pure, Google, pure Google implementations of AOS plus a number of, um, uh, uh, of, of non-Google um, implementations with non-Google Play Stores and such like. So this is what um, Android Automotive looks like. So starting at the bottom down here, we have the vehicle ECUs, uh, ele electronic control units. So these are the things which are controlling all the bits and pieces in your car. So they're doing some trivial things like turning lights on and off, the headlights and such like. And they're doing some major things like controlling the engine. The engine management unit is one of these. These are all connected together via some kind of vehicle bus. In most cases, this is going to be CAN bus. And then the interface between the ECUs and Android is a HAL. HAL is the hardware abstraction layer. And the particular HAL we're talking about here is the vehicle HAL. So the vehicle HAL is uh, interfacing between the vehicle bus and the rest of Android. The HAL then is talking up to the next level up, which over here, if I get my light to work. Um, so the next level up is the car service. So this is a system service, part of the Android operating system. And it is holding the state um, and, and presenting APIs uh, to applications based on the information from the vehicle how or, v, or vHow. Then above that, we have a library. Uh, this is android.car.jar. So this is the, the library that applications will link with in order to access the services. And then on top of that, we have the applications. So it's a fairly standard um, four-layer cake as you get with most Android uh, implementations. So I'm going to go through that in a little bit of detail. So I'm going to start off by talking about the VHAL. So the VHAL then is collecting signals from the, from the vehicle bus, from the CAN bus, and storing them in vehicle properties. So a vehicle property is essentially a data point which contains um, typically a measurement. So um, yeah, one example would be the speed of the vehicle. So that is relayed from wherever, which, whichever ECU knows how fast you're going, that's relayed uh, to that vehicle how, that's stored in a property called vehicle speed, which is in meters per second. So another one would be the uh, cabin control, the cabin temperature control. So that's a knob on the dashboard. You flip that round to whichever temperature you, you want. Uh, that is um, passed down to the vehicle HAL from the application um, and then passed to the uh, heating control unit um, as a value in degrees Celsius or something. So everything goes through the vehicle properties. So as you can see, some properties are read from the vehicle, from the vehicle bus, say the speed, for example, that's read directly from an ECU. Some properties are controlling the vehicle. So for example, we could have a slider on the screen which sets the cabin temperature. That then transmits a value to the heating and control ECU, which then sets the cabin temperature. Um, the properties are, well, there's a bunch of properties, 150, it says there, yeah, uh, predefined by AOSP, and here is one of them. 
So this actually is the heating um, target temperature. So you can see it's defined here. Uh, it's given a unique number, 503 in this case, uh, as a floating point number. And it says up here that um, it can change and uh, the access should be read and write. So if you look through that particular file, um, yeah, here you go. Uh, there's a file reference down here, types.how. If you look in types.how, you'll find uh, 150, roughly speaking, of these things, plus a bunch of other stuff. Now, the properties, the default properties defined in types.how uh, are just the, the basic stuff. Every vehicle is different. So there will be um, vendor properties. So you can extend the properties by adding your own vendor uh, properties, and you do it something like this. The key point here is that there are two property groups, one called system, one called vendor. The vendor stuff goes in the vendor group. So um, yeah, I've just got a property called vendor example, which isn't very uh, intelligent perhaps. But you can see you define it, you give it some number, so this number has to be unique. Um, the group is vendor, you give it the type, 32-bit integer maybe, and global indicates, yeah, this re refers to the entire vehicle. Annoyingly, you, en you end up having to do this twice over because you'll need to reference this variable from, uh, from C++, so you'll declare it like that. You also are gonna end up needing to access this from Java so you'll have to put it into a Java class somewhere. And then the, um, the interface to the vHow is a binder interface uh, called iVehicle. So every time you want to access these properties, you send a message to the vehicle how on iBinder. And the functions it provides are this bunch. Um, so the first are just meta stuff, so we can get information about the properties, property configurations, that's just enumeration stuff. But the interesting stuff then is we can get a property, we can set a property, and we can subscribe to a property. For example, yeah, this, this diagram could do with some work, I apologize for that. But here we have a, a simple case. We have a, an application, car app, that is talking to the service to, um, it, it wants some information. For example, it wants to monitor the vehicle speed. So it says to the car service, give me the vehicle speed. The car service will then subscribe to vehicle speed from the vehicle how. So that's then lodged with the vhow daemon um, that this uh, this application is now subscribed to this value. And then the ECU, when it uh, feeds a new value back to the vehicle HAL, uh, the vHAL is then going to send a callback, an iVehicle callback on change to the car service. That will then transmit the, set, the change to the application that's interested. So this means that we can efficiently um, monitor changes to properties and feed them all the way from the ECU uh, up to the application. Um, Android Automotive OS defines um, three different uh, modes of change. So properties are either static, never change, on change. So that means that they change intermittently and we want to know as soon as the change happens. So for example, the gear selector, um, forward, reverse, park, drive, whatever. We want to know as soon as that gear selector has changed because that's going to, you know, that's something we're interested in. Or the door unlock, we want to know immediately that the doors are unlocked, whatever. So on change, we want to know immediately the value changes. And then continuous, this is for things which are always changing. So the speed, the temperature, that kind of stuff. Um, so an on-change notification wouldn't work there. So in this case, we label it as being continuous. And then we set a sampling rate in Hertz as to how often we want to be notified of that change. So if it's the temperature, you probably want to be notified maybe once every 10 seconds or something. 
if you're monitoring the speed, you probably want to be notified maybe 10 times a second or something. So that's the VHAL. Then above that, we have uh, the car service. So the job of the car service is to take the raw properties from the VHAL and make them into useful APIs that applications can use. Um, da, 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 this is some information that isn't that useful. If you're, if you're working directly with um, Android Automotive OS, the most, mm, the most useful thing here is you can use a command called dumpsys. Dumpsys car service tells you a lot of information about what the uh, service is doing. <coughs> Excuse me a second. And then on top of the car service is the car manager. So in Android terms, for every system service, there is a manager. The manager is the API to the service. <coughs> um, so the car manager is a, a jar file called android.car.jar, which ends up in the system framework directory of your device. And the APIs, there are a bunch of Android.car uh, classes, and there is documentation for them at this link here. Not a huge amount of documentation, unfortunately. They're not heavily used at the moment. So when you go to developer.android.com and look at that class, you don't find a huge amount there, unfortunately. So within the car manager, we have a bunch of uh, services, or a bunch of interfaces, I should say. So confusingly, they are, it kind of shells out into um, 23 different interfaces. And they're all listed here, which I'm not gonna go through every single one of them. I'll leave you to read them at your leisure. But just to give you an example, the next uh, few slides, I am picking out a few uh, just to demonstrate the kind of things you're going to see there. So we're going to look at property service, info service, uh, user, yeah, um, usage restrictions, or user experience restric restriction, I suppose it should be. Uh, a bit of a digression on to Android permissions. So if you're familiar, any, anybody here written Android apps? Any Android app programmers here? Okay, a few. In that case, let me go through this. Very briefly then, in order to access um, various features, various components of Android, you have to declare in your application manifest, your Android manifest XML file, uh, various permissions. And then the system either grants you the permission or not, depending. So, Android permissions are the main way of restricting what applications can do. So in the case of automotive, uh, we have a set of Android permissions which uh, you need to access very par various parts of the vehicle. Um, the majority of these permissions are marked and again, this depends on you being familiar with Android, they're marked as being signature or privileged. Um, in essence, this means that these permissions will only be granted to applications that are built as part of the system and installed on the system partition. So these permissions are never granted to third-party apps. In fact, when it comes to third-party apps, these are the only permissions that you will be able to access. So car info, read display units, set display units, energy ports, powertrain, speed, energy. Everything else, all the, all the nitty gritty stuff to do with turning the lights on and off, making the windows go up and down, locking and unlo unlocking the doors, those are system permissions only available to system apps. Which probably is a good thing.
Um, so the permissions are per property. So there is a permission, for example, vendor, sorry, permission vendor extension, uh, which is required if you want to access any of the access any of these uh, vendor permissions, as I described earlier. So again, that means if you're putting together an Android automation, sorry, Android automotive system, then you will uh, need system apps in order to access the vendor defined permissions and properties. Okay, can I just pause there because I notice my laptop is flashing red here and it's about to shut down and I hope I put the cable in otherwise this could be short. Okay, it looks like I didn't put the cable in. No, oh, well, just beware, the screen may go blank at any time. So here's some examples of some of those services I mentioned. Um, the first one is a simple one called Car Info Service. Um, car Info Manager, I should say. So this is available to anyone and it just gives basic information about the vehicle. So the manufacturer, the model, the year, the type, um, just basic stuff. So anybody can read this stuff. This permission level is set to normal, which means anybody can read this. Um, an interesting one then is the um, user experience restricted uh, service. So this is really to enforce the driver distraction rules. So essentially, we don't want um, drivers accessing applications whilst driving. So we don't want them uh, watching YouTube or uh, playing video games. So these are uh, controlled by this, uh, this service. So this service is a very simple one. It basically says, are we in driver distraction mode or yes or no? And it returns yes or no. If you are in driver dis distraction mode, in other words, the vehicle is being driven, then it will prevent you from running certain applications. Okay, there are a bunch of other services. Like I say, I'm just going uh, a couple of examples. Uh, those are the only two I'm going to talk about. And then on top of the, so we have the car services, the car manager, which is the library, and then on top of that we have the applications. So at the application level, we get some very basic apps as part of the um, AOSP, the Android Open Source Project. And this is the list. So we get a home screen. Um, uh, which I'll show you in a, in a couple of slides time. Um, we get some very simple mock-up apps. So there's a, there's a HVAC app which mocks up um, seat temperatures and such like. Um, there's a media player app which pretends to play media, although it actually doesn't do anything. Um, there's a car maps placeholder which just displays a green screen. It doesn't even pretend to display a map and so on. So essentially, what you have to do as a vehicle manufacturer is go through and implement working versions of each of these. And that's a non-trivial exercise. Um, talking briefly about uh, displays, so vehicles typically have more than one screen. Uh, so this is a shot of the instrument cluster display. So this is a separate display um, which Android can project to. And the reason I say project is if we look on the next screen, the instrument cluster is a safety critical component uh, because it's displaying important things like the speed and various other um, vehicle status information. Android is not a safety critical operating system. It can crash at any time. So we don't want to use Android for safety critical things. So the way we do this is that there is a separate um, controller uh, hand handling the vehicle, uh, the, sorry, the instrument cluster. And it's typically a separate uh, processor. 
Uh, it's running a different operating system, typically QNX or something like that, something that is safety certified. And then Android can project an image to that um, cluster controller as a video stream, a H.264 uh, stream, and then the video controller, uh, sorry, and then the cluster controller uh, can uh, display that in a suitable rectangle. And the service that does that, I mentioned that in passing on the slide, is the instrument cluster service, um, which uh, has some APIs, which basically allow you to request focus on the cluster and then uh, use it to display um, essentially a, a, a screen or a sequence of screens. So then, um, as well as the applications written by the vehicle vendor, we have third-party applications. So these are typically downloaded through the App Store. So if you have in licensed Google Automotive Services, then you will get access to Play Store. However, the uh, applications that you can access and install at the moment at least are very restricted. So there's a note there that says, Google takes driver distraction very seriously. Your app must meet specific design requirements um, before it can be listed on Play Store for Android Automotive and Android Auto. So I take that to mean that when you submit an automotive or auto app uh, to Play Store, that somebody is going to uh, check whether that is um, uh, meets the guidelines and uh, give you some kind of feedback if it isn't. So the types of applications you can write for automotive and Android Auto um, are basically these. So you can do media apps, media meaning audio. Um, so these are typically things like streaming media, like Spotify, um, internet radio is a good one, audio books, very popular, that kind of thing. Uh, messaging apps. So these can display uh, short notifications on the screen, uh, but typically the main functionality would be in text-to-speech to read out messages and speech-to-text, which would allow you to respond to messages. Um, and then fairly recently, well, maybe six months ago now, uh, they added a third category, which are navigation-type apps. So this allows you to write applications that, uh, for example, display charging points and allow you to navigate to the nearest charging point, for example. If you're developing for Android Automotive, then Android Studio supports automotive. Um, you need uh, the latest version of Studio for this to work. And you need to install the appropriate um, uh, SDK. And then that will allow you to um, create an AVD, an Android virtual device, uh, which looks like a vehicle. So this is the ABD you get. You get basically this screen. This is the screen here. And then all the rest of it is just a, an image to make it give you the feeling that you're actually in a vehicle. Okay, so that's the main part of what I want to say. Um, oh, the, let me just come back to that moment. Yes, yeah, so how many applications actually are there out there? Um, I haven't checked it recently, but when I did check, maybe about six months ago, um, I found there are a few hundred applications that you can use with Android Auto, maybe 400 or something, um, on, on, on Play Store. For applications specifically for automotive OS, I counted 30-something. So it's not as if there are a million applications you can install on your vehicle, it's more like a few dozen.
Now, that, I'm sure, will change over time. But at the moment, yeah, it is, for these, for very good reasons, uh, restricted as to which applications you can actually run on your head unit. Okay. So, next topic, I want to talk a little bit about exterior cameras. Um, so, um, most modern vehicles, most new vehicles, have rear-facing cameras, um, which give you the, the view behind the vehicle as you reverse. And they may do additional things. They may draw a little grid, which gives you the expected course as you reverse. Some of the more sophisticated ones also have object recognition things, so they can flash up saying you, you're about to reverse into uh, a traffic bollard or something. And typically these cameras are going to be handled by the head unit, because it's got a nice big display in the middle of the vehicle. So, but there's a problem here. Android, as you know, when you turn your Android phone on, it doesn't immediately turn on if you've turned on from, from, from scratch. It has to do a cold boot, and that takes 20, 40, 60 seconds or something. Now, in the case of the head units, it's normal that the head unit is actually fully powered off. Vehicle manufacturers don't like having um, things taken up power, taken up current, because it runs the battery down. So if you leave your vehicle in the garage for uh, maybe four weeks while you're on holiday, you don't want to come back to find the battery's been drained by the IVI unit. So typically, the IVI unit is fully powered off when the ignition is off, which means that when you turn the ignition on, you've got to do a cold boot each time. So how do we get the camera display operational um, in the regulation of two seconds? So particularly in the US, it says, within two seconds of turning the ignition on, you must have that rear view display uh, present. So the way to do that is there's a subsystem called the EVS, the exterior view system, um, which can do this. So the EVS is basically a, pretty much completely separate from Android. It's a native daemon, uh, it's written in C++. Um, doesn't have any dependencies on the rest of Android, so it can come up very quickly. So, so long as you can get Android, we'll get to the Android init program within maybe one second. You've got maybe one other second, a second second, uh, to uh, bring up the EVS application and start streaming video from the re review camera uh, to, the, to the screen. So that's what all this stuff here does. Oops, not working. So just have a quick look at this then. So there is a path from the camera driver up through the application to the EVS application. Within the EVS application, that's where you do the, um, any manipulation of the images, like drawing a grid, doing object uh, detection, that kind of stuff. And then you feed the frames back down uh, to the display, typically the, the console display, and um, yeah, that's what the driver sees. And then the, there are some links over here to the right-hand side where we need to talk to the VHAL because the VHAL knows which gear has been selected. So essentially it's doing uh, a subscribe on the, uh, vehicle, uh, on the gear selection. So when the gear selection goes to reverse, that triggers uh, the EVS, and you get the rear view. So here's a little diagram showing how that works. Um, so essentially from uh, the top here, from boot up, it's just kind of looping, waiting for input from the VHAL. Actually, it doesn't tr literally loop, it actually does a subscribe as I described just now. So it's just waiting on the, for an on change on the gear selection. So when the gear selection becomes reverse, uh, the EVS system uh, jumps in, takes over the display, and displays the, uh, display the camera view. And there's two little boxes here. I'll do it with this side for change. 
There's two little boxes here because some vehicles have uh, side view cameras uh, in the place in replace to replace uh, side mirrors. So if you indicate left or right, that will uh, show the side view. So same thing. Um, da, 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 da. Yeah, so one of the consequences of this is that when the EVS application is invoked because you've selected reverse gear, that essentially grabs the display from Android. So whatever you were watching previously disappears, whatever's on the display previously disappears, and you get the camera view full screen until you then move into a forward gear. Okay, um, next topic. Uh, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about car audio and what um, Android does for that. So audio is uh, a tricky thing in a vehicle. So whereas with a smartphone, audio is pretty simple. You've got a microphone, uh, one or two speakers, and maybe a, a, a jack that you can plug in headphones. In a vehicle, it's very much more complicated. Uh, you've got multiple output channels. You've got speakers all over the place. Um, you know, smart, um, fancy cars have maybe uh, 16 or 18 speakers in the cabin. You have microphones in lots of different places to pick up uh, voice. Um, and then you have uh, headphone uh, jacks, particularly for the rear seat passengers, so they can plug in uh, and listen to you know, whatever, um, without distracting the driver. So it's a lot more complicated. So there are some changes to Android Automotive uh, to handle this. Um, yeah, the main thing is, so here's, here's a diagram from uh, developer, to, uh, sorry, source to android.com. So up here at the top, we have a number of applications each producing uh, audio streams. So there's the navigation app, there's the uh, radio app, there's the streaming media app, and so on. So they are feeding uh, those streams to a thing called Surface, uh, to Audio Flinger. So Audio Flinger is essentially the audio mixer in Android. So that's taking all these channels together, and then it does a submix, mixes down into a small number of channels. And this is, the, this is the main thing that's different between Android Automotive and regular Android. So with regular Android, you have basically just one output from Audio Flinger. With Android Automotive, you have as many as you want. So these are called buses. And each bus is an output from Audio Flinger. That's then fed into the audio amplifier. And that's then fed to an appropriate set of speakers. So we can feed these, we can essentially we can route the audio to different sets of speakers. Uh, and we do that based on the content of the audio. So a good example would be the navigation app. Uh, its audio stream will be tagged as being uh, type navigation. That will be detected in Audio Flinger, and then Audio Flinger will then route that typically to the driver's side of the vehicle because the driver is probably more interested in the navigation than anyone else. So these are the audio contexts. So within Android, you can label a, a, an audio stream with a context. Uh, here's a, a, an, an example, or some examples. And then um, those contexts are uh, mapped down into uh, buses. And yeah, here's my example about the navigation context, typically being, being used to select routing towards the, um, towards the driver. There's one other interesting thing. Uh, yeah, looking at this diagram here, over at the bottom at the left-hand side, it says chimes and warnings. So vehicles uh, are regulated to make certain noises when you do certain things. So if you engage reverse gear, it may 
play some kind of uh, noise. If you indicate left or right, that has to play some kind of noise. Plus, there may be um, status update from the vehicle itself uh, if the engine's not working correctly or something. So these are called chimes and warnings. Uh, many of them are mandated by, by regulations, so you have to do this. And it's an error if they don't uh, play correctly. So once again, because Android is not a safety critical operating system, the chimes and warnings are not played through Android. Instead, they have to be routed directly to the vehicle audio system. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think that's basically all I have to say on that. Okay, okay, we're getting through this at uh, quite a good rate. Um, so that's pretty much everything I wanted to say, just give you an introduction to, as to how the whole thing fits together, what it is, what it does. So, Android, Android Automotive OS, this is Android for the vehicle. Um, so it's Android as you know it, but with a bunch of changes made to make it work within the vehicle context. And I've mentioned a bunch of those in this presentation. Um, and, 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 and that's it, actually. Hang on a second, we haven't quite finished. So first of all then, do we have any questions on any of that? You've all been very, very quiet and attentive. So yeah, anybody working in an automotive, anybody uh, have experience of any of these things? Or any questions at all? Exactly, yes. So Well, so the, the IVI, so every vehicle has, now has an IVI system. So the IVI is the, the music system, it's the navigation system, it's the heating and control system, it's the um, turning lights on and off system, and that kind of stuff. So it does a bunch of key things to, to the vehicle, plus um, it's entertainment from the, from the driver's point of view. As I'm driving along, I want to be able to listen to the radio and so on. So, Every vehicle manufacturer at the moment has an IVI system. They're mostly based on embedded Linux using Yocto project and using a thing called AGL, which is automotive grade Linux, which is a Yocto uh, thing. And I'm sure you've used these things and they're usually terrible. So people don't, in, don't like the proprietary IVI systems. They cost a fortune to develop. So each manufacturer has a team of hundreds of engineers building these IVI systems, which everybody hates. Um, and the big problem at the moment is they don't have an app store. Or if they do have an app store, it's pretty poor. So two things then. First of all, there is a drive from the, ma from the manufacturer's point of view. They want to reduce development costs. So instead of developing their own IVI system, they are going to outsource it to Google, who gives them for free, in quotes, an IVI system, which is fully functional. So the big draw from the manufacturer's point of view is cost reduction. The other thing is that the Android environment is, um, uh, is, is based on Java, and, and you know, Android programming is, 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 is well known and easy. So it's much cheaper to hire Android programmers than it is to hire C++ programmers who know Qt. Um, you know, that's an expensive skill. That's true. Um, 
Uh, no, no, no. So it, it will integrate the so that the, the IVI system will integrate also the knobs and buttons on your on your vehicle. So you'll have knobs and buttons on the steering wheel, possibly some on the console, whatever. Each one of those knobs and buttons actually is an ECU. So they're, they're all connected to the CAN bus. They feed that through to the head unit and that can then do stuff with it. So that can feed into the radio app and turn the radio on and off, for example, or turn the lights on and off. So the, um, I, I, I agree, touch screens in vehicles are a really bad idea. Go tell Tesla. Um, but the, the physical knobs are, are not connected to anything directly. They are just providing a signal, signal via the CAN bus. You still need an application to read that signal and do something useful with it. So that, that's where it fits in. Wouldn't the control circumvent? No. Well, it's, it's got to go somewhere. So if you, if you have a knob, you have a rotary knob that's producing a sequence of, of you know, increments up or down. But something's got to, some piece of software has got to read that knob <laughs> and do something with it. So that's the IBI system. That used to be Linux. Now it's becoming Android. So the requirement, the need for the IBI system still remains. So it's, it's a complete system. Um, I'm, I, I don't know that. I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Okay, yes, so NVIDIA, yep, yes, uh, yes. Um, I, I don't have any details on NVIDIA Drive, I'm afraid, so I can't really comment. So in my experience, it's not particularly popular, but I don't know. I'll talk to you afterwards, maybe. Um, okay, anything else? Okay, well... Thank you all very much for, uh, for being here and listening to me uh, ramble on. I um, hope some of this is useful. Um, details on the, on the screen is where you can get the slides and contact me. And I'm um, happy to talk to you around the, uh, present uh, around the, 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 the show in the next day and a half. So thank you all very much. Okay, and don't forget to vote on your way out. The green ones are special. <laughs>